as you're giving, and what an honor it is tonight to have Brother Urshan with us. Amen. This morning was just so incredible. If you were not able to be here, make sure you tune in on our website or uh, Facebook and go back and hear, hear that. Uh, several months ago, I invited Brother Urshan to come and preach for us. And uh, then I, I have the privilege to travel around. And a lot of places I'm preaching, Brother Urshan is preaching. And, uh, and so after church, we'll get around the table and we'll just talk. And I remember the last time I was with him, we stayed up till 2 or 3 in the morning. And he was just uh, expounding on, on scriptures and answering questions from fellow preachers. And I thought, man, wouldn't it be great if uh, we were able to have a conversation like that in, in the house of the Lord? Because I'm going to tell you, we all have some questions. Amen? And there's things we do, we preach it the other Sunday night that are cultural. There's things that we do that are linked to scripture. And, uh, and so we opened it up and it was incredible. The, uh, just in a week's time, matter of fact, right up until walking on that platform, there's questions just coming in uh, by the, I mean, lots and lots and lots of questions. And so Anna had the responsibility and task this week to categorize them by topic. And so we're trying to, we're, we'll try to take some questions this evening. And hopefully those questions will also answer uh, some of the other questions. So we've grabbed some, uh, trying to get different topics covered. Uh, if we're not able to get through it, we continue on, and uh, we'll we'll be here. We'll take about an hour tonight and try to get through some of these great questions. And I'm excited about what uh, what God is going to do tonight. You know what? As you begin to, it's okay. Someone said, "Is it doubt to ask a question?" No. Jesus asked a question. He said, "Why is thou forsaken me?" <laughs> Philip asked questions. Job asked questions. And so a question in the right spirit, amen, is okay. Amen. And so we were able to filter out the ones that weren't in the right spirit. And we got the ones that were in the right spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Because a question is one that you're wanting to know the answer to, not trying to make a statement. Amen. So we're not here to debate. We're here to truly answer the question. So once your question has been answered, here's what I want you to do. I want you to say, I receive it. Practice. Say, I receive it. I receive it. Amen. And so if you're ready to receive God's word from God's messenger, I want Brother Urshan to come. Amen. Why don't we welcome Brother Urshan here tonight as we begin this question and answer. All right. Well, good evening, Brother uh, Urshan. First and foremost, I think before we jump in here, um, I would like you just to introduce your side. Normally, I'm introducing you, but uh, even better, tell us a little bit about you, your family, uh, experience, education, and anything you would like to, that we uh, need to know. Absolutely. Well, it's an honor to be with, with you tonight, Brother Tuttle. I, I've, <clears throat> I've had those late night conversations. Oftentimes, it's a great joy, and so I'm excited to invite everybody into the living room. We'll just keep this between us. <laughs> and the internet. <laughs> and the, that's right. Um, I, I am married to the greatest woman in the world. Her name is Jacqueline Urshan. I have two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. And this one. isn't supposed to be a debate, but I'm going to debate you on that <laughs> right there. This is, uh, <laughs> you've got the second greatest. That's right. <laughs> yes. I have a wonderful daughter-in-law, Cheyenne. Um. I pastor in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I, I planted a church in Fort Myers, Florida when I was 22 years old. That church is the Rock Church, pastored by Randy Williams. Um, I've evangelized a good deal. I, I planted a church in Roatan, Honduras. Later on, um, that church is now pastored by Stephen Jones in, in Honduras. Um, I then went to South Haven, Mississippi, which is a suburb of Memphis, and um, pastored there for th uh, almost three years, and then I moved to Durham to take a church there from Brother Johnny Godair. <clears throat> so that's kind of my ministerial background. My education, um, I have an undergrad degree in uh, psychology and a master's degree in Christian ministry. I am working on uh, preparing to enter into a PhD program that if things continue at the same pace they are now, I should be done by about 2053. So <laughs> it's all <clears throat> a work in progress. <laughs> and I like breakfast. <laughs> That's, yeah, three greatest meals of the day, breakfast, breakfast, and breakfast. So 
uh, that's about it. There's not much more than that. <laughs> well, there were several personal questions that came through, but we're going to stick to the Bible. Um, and we try to categorize it into different categories. There were several that came through on the Godhead and the oneness of God. So we'll begin right there, if that's okay, jumping right in. Um, here's a question that comes in. I think you can answer it while answering multiples. Uh, what does it mean when the Bible says in Genesis 1, let us make man in our image? There's only one God, so why are there pronouns, us and our, being used? That is a great question. That is one that oneness believers get a lot. Um, so Genesis 1.26, the plural pronouns. When the religious world uses that verse, they want to say that that is um, divine beings having a conversation. So... God the Father is talking to God the Son, and they're working out how they're going to create man. That is not what that means. <clears throat> There's a, a host of different perspectives on that. There's a concept called the um, plurality of majesty that in the Old Testament people, uh, monarchs, kings, would refer to themselves in... Um, plural form because of the many attributes that they displayed. Some people feel that it's that. Um, other people feel like God was talking to the angels. That's the rabbinical view that the Jews take. I don't believe that that's what it is, though. I believe um, that that is a conversation that God is having with the man Christ Jesus. There are, and this is something that oneness believers don't need to be afraid of. Uh, Jesus, as a man, was a real man. It was an authentic humanity. He had a mind, a, the mind of a man, the, the will of a man. We know that he had a will of a man because he had to submit the will of his flesh to the will of the Spirit. Not my will, thy will be done. So there's conversations in the Bible between the man Christ Jesus and God, the Spirit. <clears throat> And he prayed just like we pray. So I'm not afraid of those. We don't need to be afraid of those. You can't understand the scripture if you are not willing to bravely look at them head on. And people need to know that. So instead of divine being two saying to divine being one, hey, help me out here. Let me submit my divine will to your divine will. That's not what the Bible's teaching. Okay, that's the first thing. I think it is a conversation between the Spirit and the man Christ Jesus. Um, the Bible says of, of Jesus Christ that he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Um, all things is all things. Before water, before land, before the cosmos, as the logos, as the word of God, as the expression of that Spirit he is before all things. He, um, he created all things as God. And so um, we're not afraid of that. If he's before all things, that means he's before Adam. Right. And so God is literally saying, we're not going to create Christ in Adam's image. We're going to create Adam in Christ's image with the knowledge that he is slain from the foundation of the world before anything ever happened God already knew the redemptive mind and plan of God he knew his own mind and there now so to add another layer to that because this is a big question you're going to get this from a lot of people who want to view at it view it very simplistically God speaks outside of time so God was having conversations when there was nobody there Hebrews chapter 1, he speaks to the Son before the Son's ever born. Now, Trinitarians want to say that's a divine being he's talking to, but he's not. God is speaking things out before he ever gets there. For instance, um, in Psalms, he says, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. He said that before Jesus was ever born, but he speaks it out. Because while we have to wait for the days to pass and the weeks to pass, God doesn't. God lives outside of all of that, and to God, it's all as if it happened in a moment. He lives in eternity. So my firm belief is it is just like, you know, there's a couple conversations that we know he had. Um, to the son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever settled. A scepter of righteousness. I have anointed you with 
um, the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Hebrews chapter 1 documents these conversations before Jesus was ever born. Um, and I think that's exactly what it was. It was that conversation that he had in eternity. Yeah, so you're saying the spirit, in essence, is looking into time, yep. viewing Christ in, in that image he made. That's exactly man. right. Great answer. Um, <clears throat> We'll jump, and that's a one, oneness. There's a lot on the oneness. Again, like I said, we had over 100 questions. Uh, another topic that was very common, especially now, in the, it's a hot topic in our culture, which is one of the transgender, homosexuality is so prevalent. And it's even slipping into, we see Christianity, some, some denominal organizations that are ordaining and licensing um, homosexuals. So I'm grabbing one question of several, and hopefully that will answer, help people out. But uh, here's one. Old Testament law. How do you explain that the old law isn't null and void, but we don't have to follow all of it, such as the mixing of fabrics, but, but such as homosexuality is still applied? Do you understand that you got that question? Yeah, okay. I do. How are we going to apply the law? Is the law null and void? How can we say that it's null and void if we're still applying certain aspects of it? And how do we know which ones we apply? Yeah. So I think that we still follow the law. Um, we still follow the law. The law, Jesus makes this statement. He said, think not that I came to destroy the law. I did not come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. Right. So in that sense, if you take the office of the high priest, we still follow that. Now, we don't have a Levitical priesthood, but it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And he is the great high priest. And when he works on our behalf, he is working all the time. So we still obey the concept of the high priest. We still obey the concept of the sacrificial lamb. Though we don't have livestock out back. Right. Um, we're not raising sheep to kill or goats to kill. But Jesus is the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. But we still obey that. Right. We still obey the principle of the blood. Um, so all those principles are fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and many of those ceremonial dynamics are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, there's a place in the Bible where uh, it teaches that you are not supposed to put a muzzle on an ox that treads out corn. That was a law. If you did that, you sinned. <laughs> Anybody got to worry about that lately? <clears throat> um, <laughs> I haven't been worried about that, to be honest. Um, but, you know, when we get to the New Testament, Paul teaches that as a, an admonition to how we treat ministry. Don't muzzle the ministry that are doing the work of God. And then he says, does God take care for oxen or saith he it altogether for our sakes? We still obey that. We don't put muzzles on the beast of burden, the ministry, the people that carry the burden. So those things are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Well, when it comes to the mixing of fabrics and... You can take it further than that. The planting of different seeds in, in the field. And, um, you know, there are concepts of that that we absolutely still obey. Separation being one of them. Um, they planted one at a time. God taught oneness through that. So there are things that are very clearly fulfilled in Jesus Christ that we do still follow in the Holy Ghost. Sabbath day, we observe that, that Jesus Christ fulfills that. Um, meat and drink, these things are fulfilled in Christ. Now, there are aspects of the law that are not spiritually fulfilled. They were very straightforward and linear from the beginning, and they still are now. So everybody wants to throw out the Old Testament, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, do not covet. These things are, are moral Laws that reflect God's moral nature, and they never change. They're not spiritually fulfilled. They are literally fulfilled in every facet of how they were given and are given. And we follow them uh, today just like we did back then. So those moral obligations that reflect God's moral nature, um, they are very clear, and homosexuality falls under that. And then the New Testament teaches that very clearly. That's a great, and maybe a follow-up there. Someone's, someone's battling with feelings of homosexuality, but does not act on the lifestyle. Is that sin? I think that we can be tempted and not sin. Yeah. 
<clears throat> so sin tempts, people can be tempted with sin, all manner of sin, and homosexuality is a sin. And a person can, can be tempted by things, um, whether it's heterosexual or, or homosexual, but if they are living in Christ, they're overcoming on a daily basis, then uh, temptation is not the same thing as sin, and you do not have to yield to any form of sin uh, when you're walking in Christ. Amen. There's a lot of questions there, but I think the excellent answers. We'll move on to several on divorce and remarriage. So I want to grab um, here. Could you please explain uh, Matthew chapter 19? It's verse 8 and 9. I've had trouble understanding. Does this mean if someone's divorced and remarries that they are committing adultery? And then uh, another question, I'll kind of combine these. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 11, it says a divorced woman should remain single or reconcile only to her husband. So why does our movement preach it's okay to remarry if your spouse cheats on you? Yeah, this is Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 19. 19. 8 and 9. 19, okay. 8 and 9. Uh, this is the famous, the famous divorce passage. Right. <laughs> yes. So... For context, he saith unto them, this is Jesus, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Okay, this is a massive topic. Yeah, yeah. And I don't claim to have every single answer. I don't know that any man outside of Jesus Christ right. has every answer. I think we tread carefully here, and I think this has been a debate since Moses' day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is not something just for 2022. People have wrangled over this and fought with this because human relationship and sexuality is very core to humanity. And um, I think there are many men and women who have come to this crossroads in their life. So Moses basically said men can divorce for whatever they feel like. And in that time and in that culture, basically men were the ones who did the divorcing. They could put away their wives. When Jesus comes to the scene, they're still wrangling over this. They're still fighting over it. Is this right? Is this wrong? Um, and, you know, even... He has to answer the question at another time. There's a woman who married a man, and that man died. And, and then his brother, like the law says, married her to raise up seed, and he died. And then, and then he, his brother came, and seven brothers. Right. <laughs> so what should be done? And my first instinct is stop marrying this lady. My God, help us. There's something going on. <laughs> run, run. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, <laughs> you know, this, this was something that they really, really grappled with. And Jesus has to take the time to try to address it. And so he makes a statement from the beginning, it was not so. I would say that the very short answer to this is we live in an increasingly sensualized world. People, if they don't like how you make the bed, they're ready to get a divorce. And so we, we teach that when a person makes a vow, it is till death do us part. That is for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. We believe those vows. We make those vows. So the apostolic world has contended for this. Now, up to 40 years ago, it was very rare for people to, to divorce. I can remember, I'm 46 years old, I can remember when it was rare for a person to have a baby out of wedlock. And now, it's even the majority. Yeah. It's in the majority of things. So, uh, the overall context here, we are seeing a radical redefinition of sexuality. Yeah. Down to the point now, now people don't even know what man, male and female is. Right. And make no mistake about it, much of this is driven by lust. It is just simple lust. So we've got to be very careful that we do not follow the societal trends. We are the city set on a hill. We are the, the light that is put on the candlestick. 
Um, so you do see a trend. You see a trend of people allowing for divorce and, and a lot of that covenantal dynamic being loosened. And there's probably two schools of thought. There's, there's one school of thought that states that once you get married, you can never divorce for any reason. Uh, or if you do, you can never remarry for any reason until death do us part. And they're taking that from here where Jesus says um, that you're supposed to remain together. We have looked at it, and I personally feel, and I, I'm going to make an allowance for this, that I don't claim to know everything, that we're going to contend for marriage if a person divorces for immorality, sexual promiscuity, sometimes people will divorce because of physical abuse um, or some type of a grievous sin. We should always, we should always try to contend for the original covenant and the Bible teaches, let them be reconciled. Right. We preach reconciliation. So if a person is to repent, um, you want to be able to be reconciled to your spouse. Um, the question then is, can they ever remarry at all? And, uh, you know, we're going to fight for the marriage. We're going to fight for the covenant. Ultimately, I would say that if a person has a spouse that it is impossible to reconcile with them, they have moved on, they have lived uh, a life of sin. The Bible says if the unbeliever departs, let them depart. When that happens, is an the innocent spouse bound to remain single and celibate for their whole life? And the Bible doesn't say yes or no. Yeah. So because of that, we, we fall back on, on the nature of God. And God is a just God. And he's a merciful God. In a case like that, does God... Does God demand that a 25-year-old remain celibate for the rest of their life? Um, you tread carefully, but if, if there is no solution, if there is no opportunity for reconciliation, if there is no hope, the spouse is not dead but has moved on and is not coming back, then I personally feel that a person does have grounds to remarry. Um, now, I'm careful when I say that because I believe that's the most extreme of circumstances. Unfortunately, people aren't doing that. They're actually remarrying and remarrying and remarrying to the point where one scholar called it sequential polygamy. Yeah. You're married to multiple people just at different times. Yeah. Wow. Now, and obviously this would be after all things are new after repentance and filling of the Holy Ghost. So. You know, divorce, remarriage prior to... Judgment begins at the house of God. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, because yeah, people are coming in. They're coming in from... Right, right. Insanity, sure. sin. So you could have been married three times, but yeah. you're born again of water and spirit. It basically, yes. it's a reset. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. So judgment begins at the house of God. That is where we go back to. So yeah, absolutely. When a person makes these Well, decisions. talking about God's mercy and, and judgment, that kind of segues into a question on, um, I have... Um, if someone, are, do you believe if someone is uh, filled with the gift of the Holy, or I'm sorry, baptized, the question is here, I, I'm baptized in Jesus' name, I'm doing everything I can on my way to um, the cross in essence, um, and I die, am I saved? It would fall into like deathbed conversion. So mm -hmm. someone's on their deathbed, you know, they've <laughs> perhaps been baptized uh, or they've been filled, whichever way you want to say that, but yet have to complete have yet to complete the full new birth conversion. That, that question actually came through multiple different ways. I think we can answer that right yeah. now. Yeah. So is there deathbed conversion? Or maybe, maybe we could ask it this way. Can a person go to heaven under any circumstances if they have never been baptized or if they have never received the Holy Ghost? Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to initially say no. Yeah. Um, and I'm saying that because Jesus said, except a man is born of the water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Um, we can only go on what the scripture tells us. Right. So the new birth, you cannot inherit if you're not born. So, you know, people want to go to the last 10 minutes of a person's life right. and say, well, how can God be just if the person wants to 
give their life to the Lord, but they can't get to water or they can't, um, they don't have the opportunity. And, you know, you can try to cram the judgment and mercy of God into the last 10 minutes. I have a feeling that it's, there's a possibility that God is going to look at the previous 65 years and say, I gave you every opportunity. Um, and so it's real tempting to look at that last 10 minutes. And you can make a hypothetical out of any, anything. You know, they're in the desert and, right, right. you know, it's, there's nobody there. And, you know, it, it's, so now I'm saying that based on the scripture. We are judged by the scripture. Heaven and earth shall pass away. His word shall not pass away. If the scripture were so easily bent at our whim, then Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross. He could have said, yeah, you didn't really mean it, right? Right, 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 right. But God himself faced it full head on, took upon himself the form of a man and died the death of the cross to fulfill every jot and tittle, the dotting of the I, the crossing of the T. If he does that, we do that. Um, now, if a person wants to push that issue after death, I'm not the judge. You know, if you want to hope for the best, if you want to roll the dice, as it were, so to speak, and, and say, well, and he is a merciful God, and maybe you did have every intention of getting baptized. Now, that, that's up to God when you get to the throne, but I'm not going to live my life that way. I'm going to live my life as best I can according to the word of the Lord, and that is what the word of the Lord says. Yeah, it's a great answer. Of course, everyone in this room, you have an opportunity tonight. So uh, if you pose the question, get baptized, don't wait till the last 10 minutes. Do not leave without right. getting baptized. Right. On the other hand, I, it's a challenging question because I think our humanity, you know, you want to say, oh, yes, they're going to heaven. I, but I, I appreciate the uh, sticking, you know, it's a great answer. Uh, several on killing as far as um, how do you justify uh, soldiers <laughs> killing uh, for our country? But our uh, commandments tell us not to kill each other. That's a great question. You know, when it says thou shalt, you know, the, the, another way that that is phrased oftentimes to me is can a man defend himself? Yeah, that, that was one of them as well. Someone comes into your house and they're going to uh, harm your family. Yeah. Do you, uh, are you justified in defending yourself? I carried a 38 special with me when I pastored in <laughs> Fort Myers, Florida. <laughs> Your page just went up, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I don't plan on using that. 99% of people know that I'm Pastor Urshan, but for the 1% that don't know, we just want to be careful. So, you know, I would walk into extremely rough areas, um, drug dealers and, and things of that nature. I never had to be put in that position. But I do not believe that if a man or a woman is put in a life or death situation that we just have to go meekly to the slaughterhouse. I don't believe that God gave me testosterone and masculinity so that someone could just run over my family. Um, so when the Bible said thou shalt not kill, it doesn't mean you can't take human life. It means you cannot murder. You cannot unjustly take human life. And that's a very clear, it's very clear in Hebrew. You know, we read it in English, it says thou shalt not kill, but that word lends itself to the unjust taking of a human life. Um, it does, I am the protector of my home, and the Bible says that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so I will defend my home, I will defend my, myself, I will defend the innocent, and I, I'll do it as best I'm able, and hopefully we can avoid all of that by being wise. Now, in terms of military service and, and the taking of human life. You know, I encourage people, if you're going to serve in the military, first of all, I recommend that you find something else possibly to do than go in the military, particularly in the politicized world we live in. But if you're going to serve, there's nothing wrong with patriotism. Don't go into a combatant role if you can help it. Um, serve in a, in a non-combatant role. And the reason I say that is we, we do not fight for the kingdoms of this world. And you can look at it this way in a hypothetical situation. Say you are a Christian. You're baptized. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. You are in a combatant role. And there is another soldier on the other side who is baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. And you kill them. Yeah. Well, we are not part of this world in that sense. Yeah. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, you know, having lived 
through a few decades, you see that politicians make moves and they, they, they capriciously take lives and they pull out and they go in. I've got friends, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be political, but I've got friends that served in Afghanistan and they were, they were devastated when, when things happened the way they did recently. And people could talk about Vietnam and the Gulf of Tonkin and all kinds of stuff. But I would serve in a non-combatant role because I would not want to take life uh, in the name of a human kingdom. Yeah, that's an excellent answer. Uh, jumping into um, some, there's obviously a lot on outward holiness. Um, one of the first ones was, other than our bodies being the temple of the Holy Ghost, what does the Bible say about tattoos? <clears throat> <laughs> Tattoos. All right. <clears throat> Can I take a minute to provide a little context here? Um, you know, there are people who, who believe that it does not matter at all what your outward appearance looks like. At all. Um, and, and I think that's absurd. If you're going to go for a job interview and you go in there and you have bed head and your shirt's untucked and you didn't iron it and you haven't taken a shower and you walk in there and say, I would like the vice president role <laughs> in this corporation. And don't judge me, Pharisee. <laughs> um, you know, it's not going to go well. You know, <laughs> holiness, people view it from a... Uh, the idea that it's just a bunch of stuff you can't do. Yeah. Okay, the Bible calls it the beauty of holiness. Yeah. Holiness is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And God does care as to how we keep our body. We are body, soul, and spirit. Right. <clears throat> so in the Bible, there's one place where it talks about tattoos. Um, I'll, I'll read it here in a second. We'll pull it up. Leviticus 19 is where it's at. Um, I teach our people. I, I give them this analogy. I say, let's say that you need a babysitter for your five-year-old daughter. And you and your wife are going to go out a nice night on the town. And you say, hey, I, I need a babysitter. And your friend says, hey, I got just the right person. They are great with kids. They are fabulous. You, you need to use them. You say, okay, great, just have them come over. And, you know, time comes to go to dinner. You, the doorbell rings, you answer the door. And there in the doorway is a man, six foot five, tattooed, pierced, purple mohawk, um, all leather. Maybe a few body modifications. And he says, I'm here to babysit your daughter. <laughs> now... I'm using the absurd to illustrate what I'm saying, but the outside matters. It matters. Um, now, they say you can't judge a book by its cover, but at the same time, God wants us to represent him. So, um, and I think the default position of holiness, you're going to find that holiness is offensive to the flesh. It's not what I want it is what God wants. And I'm supposed to take up my cross daily. I'm supposed to crucify my flesh with the affections and the lusts thereof. So holiness is, in a lot of circles, is falling out of favor with a lot of people because it requires sacrifice. It requires death to self. It requires that the flesh die. And we're living in a world that's hyper-saturated with wanting to look cool and look like the latest reality TV star or whatever it is. Everybody wants to be a Kardashian in our world um, or whatever, whoever their latest person is. So as the body of Christ, you know, we're supposed to represent Christ in the earth. And <clears throat> so... I even think that this is going to get a little bit into what in the Old Testament still applies. Yeah. Because, you know, in Leviticus 19, well, let's read it. Leviticus 19. Let's pull it up. Because it's the only place. There we go. 
You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. What's the verse before that say? <laughs> you shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. So in this place, not only does it deal with tattoos, it deals with facial hair. Well, and that's interesting. I mean, that's interesting because there's a lot here, and I think it's a hot topic. Apostolic movement has always taken a position of clean shaven. Um, so, yeah, while we're here, what, where do you stand there? Do we really want to go? <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're here. That's why we're here. Well, I, I love this because <clears throat> I think that if we took a poll of people, in Christianity, there's a lot of concern that we are barreling down the road towards less and less consecration. This is true in terms of people now saying there can be homosexual ministers, um, men in women's dress. You know, does God care what we look like? Well, the Bible teaches against cross dressing. And it says that a man is supposed to wear a man's garments and a woman is supposed to wear a woman's garment. So a frequent question I'll get is, well, what if a woman has women's pants on? Does God care? And my response to that is, well, how will you feel when your son asks if he can wear a manly skirt? <laughs> oh, well, I... I, I, I you know, then, then there's a little bit of backward movement. Um, but cross-dressing is cross-dressing, yeah. and it has led to the breakdown of gender distinction. God wanted a man to be a man, and he wanted a woman to be a woman. Right. <clears throat> so this is the only verse here that deals with tattoos. And if I'm going to represent Jesus Christ in the earth, I want to represent him body, soul, and spirit. This, this even comes down to uh, makeup and coloring our bodies and modifying our bodies. You know, this cutting in your flesh for the dead, you know, we don't really do that anymore, but what about body modification? It's a big trend where people are inserting studs under their skin. Some people like, they like horns. Right, right. You know, a tasteful little horn, just. <laughs> <laughs> nothing big, nothing major, just, you know, a little something there to really. Well, and we laugh now, but if, you know, if this question would have been posed and you'd have brought it up from tattoos or beards 100 years ago, that we would have had the same laughter. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So the day will come that modern Christianity will even accept, it as will. they are with homosexuality, it's exactly horns, right. and yeah. where does it stop? Is where the does it stop? Yeah. And it doesn't stop. No. So um, there was a time when God forbade this, um, and he ties tattooing, cuttings, and marks upon a person cuttings in the flesh for the dead, it is linked to our daughters being given over to prostitution. The Bible says the land becomes full of wickedness. I think we're seeing the land becoming full of wickedness right now. And I think there's this feeling by godly people like I'm being herded in a direction. I am being forced into a direction. And I think there's a lot of apostolic people that say, I don't really know what to say about this, but it really makes me uncomfortable. Do we have any scripture for this? Well, there was a time when God said, do not do this. And so if I'm going to represent Jesus Christ in the earth, you know, I'm going to honor him and how he created me. And we don't paint flowers. We don't, we don't decorate flowers and change that. There is a natural design and a beauty to things. 
And so when it comes to tattooing our bodies or modifying our bodies, I saw one guy who actually split his tongue so that he had two tongues. Um, you know, I know the Bible talks about cloven tongues, but I'm almost positive that's not what that means. <laughs> and, you know, and then the question becomes, well, where are we going to draw the line? Everybody draws the line somewhere. People would say, well, obviously that's not right. right. Well, how, what do you mean obviously? Right. There was a time when people would say where we are now right. obviously wasn't right. right. Everybody has a line. Right. The question is, where will you draw that line? So as the church, we have drawn the line that we are not going to tattoo our bodies. Um, and it doesn't explicitly say it in the New Testament, but there's a lot of things it doesn't say in the New Testament. Like, you know, it doesn't say that you can't smoke cigarettes or marijuana or, <laughs> yeah, shoot things, freebase things, snort things. We deal with the most depraved dynamics of society and you know, there's a place in scripture where the writer said it seemed good to Christ and it seemeth good to us. So we have the mind of Christ. We're following the things of God. Does this glorify God? Um, now, I will say that this is tied to facial hair. Facial hair does matter. Not only does that matter, but uncut hair on a woman matters and cut hair on a man matters. And that, that comes down to gender distinction. We're living in a world where in, in, the, in the sexual revolution of the 1970s, things were just thrown out the window. Every societal norm, every, every single thing that people held dear was just thrown out. And men grew their hair out long. Um, women began to cut their hair. They, they began to rebel against things. And they said, we are free. We are being liberated. This is the world that gives us yeah. Yeah. all of that freedom. Now there's a world that has gone into the bizarre and the macabre and the extreme. Yeah. And this is exactly what God warned us would happen when he said that the land would become full of wickedness. We are rapidly approaching times where God judged cities and where God overthrew entire cities in judgment. Um, now, the facial hair dynamic. You know, we have a lot of men now who really want to grow beards. And in the apostolic church, we encourage men to, to shave their face clean. Now, I know that there's a lot of people that find controversy with that. Um, and the first thing that people will say is, Jesus had a beard. And, and I believe that Jesus had a beard. Uh, in the Hebrew world, they did have beards. Um, there's many, many scriptures that teach this. You know, the uh, anointing oil ran down the beard of Aaron. Um, a, a cause of uh, shame was to shave a portion of one's beard. So there's no doubt that in the, in the Old Testament world that they, and even the ancient world, they had beards. But I want to point something out. This verse doesn't forbid beards. It forbids modification of beards. So most of the guys I meet, they got like a little soul patch right here. Or they got like a goatee that they, they braid down, you know, here. And they got designs cut into it. And they're like, Jesus had a beard, bro. And I'm like, hold up. He didn't have that kind. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the Hebrew beard was Santa Claus. Yeah, yeah it was Duck Dynasty. It was, yeah. it, you know, it was a full Hebrew beard forbidden to trim anything, forbidden to change or modify anything. That's right. And that was included with tattoos. Now, all of these things here in Leviticus 19 actually had to do with idolatry. It was the pagan customs of the heathen around Israel. Israel was commanded to come out from among them. Amen. Amen. Come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. I will receive you unto myself. Right. This has its roots in 
uh, pagan worship, idolatry, becoming like everybody else. And Israel would always get tri tripped up with this. They would always want to be like everybody else. You know, when Balaam talked to Balak about Israel, he said, the people shall dwell alone. And there is an aloneness yeah. to the people of God, an identity that he says, I have chosen you for myself. You will not be like everybody else around you. And the desire to be like everybody else around you will make you stumble and their gods will become a snare unto you. Right. Um, and so I find that there is a big push towards tattoos and modification of facial hair. Most of the guys who want facial hair, they don't want full Hasidic beards. They want goatees. Right, right, right. And the Bible does forbid that here. Now, you can say, well, that's Old Testament. And in this same portion of Scripture, it does talk about linen garments and cotton garments. Um, so we have to take this in a New Testament mindset. The Bible describes this as pollutions of idols. Pollutions of idols. And when you get to the book of Acts, the Jews had a problem with this. When the Gentiles were coming in, they asked themselves, what are we going to tell them? to do. Are we going to tell them to circumcise? Are we going to tell them to observe Sabbath days? And Paul took a lot of time to say, no, we're not. Right. Circumcision is not necessary for salvation. And, and the Sabbath day is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He told the church at Colossia that. But he did say to stay away from eating of blood yeah. and things strangled and fornication. And then he inserts pollutions of idols. Now, that's a New Testament reference that directly references this. Yeah. So, um, the, the two options we have, this forbids goatees, the two, and, and any other facial hair modification. So, the two options are full beards or clean shaven. Those are the two options that, that are then presented to us. And we encourage people to be clean shaven. I encourage my young men to be clean shaven. And the reason I do that can, can a person go to heaven if they have a full beard? I, I think so, yes. Yeah. Um, but I encourage my, my men to be clean shaven because I, the Bible says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Right. All things are lawful, but all things edify not. Right. I want to be the best witness for Jesus Christ I can be. And there are some people that have a genuine problem with facial hair yeah. and um, what it represents. And we have a biblical precedent for this. Right. You know, the Bible says when Timothy was going to preach with Timothy, they were going to preach to the Jews. Paul said, wait, yeah. hold on. Yeah, you're, they're not going to hear you. No. Well, why aren't they going to hear me? Well, they know your dad's a Greek. Right. And so I got a question for you, Timothy. Are you circumcised? Right. Yeah. And Timothy said, well, well no, I'm not. Didn't you just take chapters and tell me I didn't have to be? Right. Like, a lot, you said it a lot. Yeah. And Paul told Timothy, well, if you go in there exercising your full Christian liberty, they're not going to hear you. That's right. They're Jews. And to them, they can't receive what you're going to say. They're not going to be able to get past this physical dynamic. That's right. So, I got some bad news, Timothy. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to go any further. I'm going to let you guys right. fill in the blanks on that. But <laughs> right. look what Timothy could have said. Right. I will not. Right. Right. <laughs> I'm free in Christ. Pharisee. Legalist. I have liberty. I'm all about the love of God. I always, I always get a kick out of that. Yeah. The people that are yeah. Yeah. So talking about it. It's about the love of God. Right. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah the most Sorry. tolerant yeah. or the most intolerant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. So, so Timothy willingly submits himself for the greater good. And he says, because I know they can't hear me like this, I will do this. Right. And I tell my young men, I'm asking you, in our culture, Facial hair is a thing. Yeah. So I'll ask you, if you're going to be used in ministry, if you're going to represent the church, I'll ask you to be clean shaven. I know it's not necessary to go to heaven, um, but if you're going to represent Jesus Christ, then submit yourself, yield yourself to it in this culture that we're in right now, and 
um, just be glad that that's all I'm asking you to do. <laughs> yeah, you could be Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and would you if I asked you? <laughs> so that's my answer. Yeah, absolutely. And it's in the spirit of holiness, and, uh, which is one of beauty and love for. Um, in that, in that, on that topic, and we've got so many, even though westernized Pentecostalism was established in the early 1900s, do we seriously believe people who have truth and revelation of Christ but don't look Pentecostal are destined for eternal damnation simply because they are not, in quotations, one of us, referring to the body of oneness apostolic believers as a whole, not Eastgate itself? So what is, what is the, what's the question, actually? So the question is, are you basically, I, 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 can you go to heaven and not look Pentecostal? <laughs> 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 Got it. And, and perhaps the word, yeah, I don't think the word Pentecost, look Pentecostal, we're, we're going for looking scriptural, right? Yeah. Okay, so I think there's layers to that. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think that if a person has fulfilled the new birth, say somebody got the Holy Ghost and got baptized today, right. and they don't know anything about Pentecost, they walk out and get hit by a car, I think they go straight to heaven. Right. Um, and so that's, having fulfilled, that's in the context of having fulfilled the new birth. Now a person grows right. in grace and knowledge. God begins to reveal things to him. As babes, we desire the sincere milk of the Lord and we grow into it. So I don't think you have to have a classical Pentecostal dynamic. I'm not, I don't think the body of Christ has to, you know, have this rubber stamp of everybody looks exactly alike. I do believe that we have to obey the scriptural mandates. And so I do think God expects us to live and dress modestly. I think that um, there has to be a distinction between male and female. And I think that um, once you learn what the scripture teaches about ornamentation and you grow in your knowledge of that and, and pleasing the Lord, that we then begin to serve him body, soul, and spirit. Um, so I don't know that there's a rubber stamp that you have to look like this one version of Pentecost. Now, I, know, I remember in Fort Myers, Florida, we had a very new church. And everybody was first generation. So when we would go to conferences, they would see people that received the Holy Ghost in the 1960s and 1970s who did their hair a certain way and had very what you would consider a classical Pentecostal look to them. My people look nothing like that because they didn't have that frame of reference. Um, now, they, they did. They didn't have the women did not cut their hair. The men did cut their hair. And, and they all were they followed the apostolic mandates, but they didn't follow what some might consider to be a classical look. Um, and obviously... People from other nations are going to have distinctives that are different from us and wouldn't be English. Um, now, if it's modest and if it is gender distinctive, then I think that there's a lot of people that are going to heaven just like that. I think people that follow the scripture are going to heaven and there's no rubber stamp on it. Yeah, and it's a continual process. So you would say, well, just if it, well, it kind of goes back to the deathbed thing, you know, if justification is, is quantifiable at that time it's water baptism infilling of the holy ghost evidence by speaking in the tongue but sanctification is then something we pursue yes. until our deathbed it is right so in that process could be different speeds for different people is that appropriate absolutely and i even throw this out i think that there can be an over emphasis on outward conformity right and agreed. a no development of inner sanctification absolutely agreed 100 percent. and i think that's worse yeah yeah that's hypocritical yeah so there are people that have this Pentecostal look that are mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, would you say that in order to comply, you have to understand? That's a very good question. I think that there are things that can be done in obedience that a person can choose to do. Maybe they don't understand every single thing. Like, I don't think a person has to totally understand Jesus' name, baptism, to obey right. being baptized in Agreed. Jesus' name. Agreed. And God will honor that. Um, so I don't think complete understanding is just a prerequisite, but I certainly, the Bible talks about the, the riches of the full assurance of understanding. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I like that. Yeah, 
You know, I, I don't live the way I live because somebody's twisting my arm. Um, and I, I don't want to put an undue burden on anybody. Um, I want to serve the Lord. And it's not something that I'm preaching, don't do, don't do. Okay, so can I take a second to talk about that? A lot of people live their life with a bunch of don't do this. That's not what the Bible's about. And you know, you can look at the Ten Commandments like, don't do, don't do, don't do. And that's how they looked at it in the Old Testament. And the Bible says that the law was, it yielded death. Don't do this, don't do this. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And people have this stern visage of this angry God. If you do it, you are going to hell. Right, right, yeah. And that's how they view the Lord. Sure. But when we read it from the New Testament, those commandments actually become great promises. I I really want you to grab that. From the Old Testament, it was a stern rebuke and almost a threat. From the New Testament, it's not. It's written from the perspective of grace and mercy and the love of God, which is God's default. He's not willing that any should perish. God wasn't trying to beat people up with the word. But when he said, thou shalt not, he didn't mean it as thou shalt not. What he meant was, when I come down into your heart, thou shalt not kill. That's excellent. And so for the person that can't stop sinning, they can't stop doing wrong. I tried to do good. I can't stop. When you get the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not. I couldn't stop it on my own, but when he shows up, when he comes down into my heart, it's a promise that you don't have to destroy everything. You don't have to be a slave to sin. So the perspective is not a bunch of rules of don't do. It's what I can do through Christ. Delighting yourself in the Lord. That's it. Yeah, he gives you the desires. And the, yeah, that's incredible. Great. That's incredible. It is. It's a, and I think that's why you see this fervency and fire within a new convert. Yeah. You know, you don't have to. They're not the ones probably not the ones filling out these questionnaires <laughs> you know, they're like whatever we have to do right to be saved there's such a, a fervency and it's linked to that spirit that's that's a great answer uh, moving on to the holy ghost so we've only got about five or minutes or so left um, when the apostles spoke in tongues they were understood by others this is a question yet when many of us speak in tongues no one can understand so what's the point if we're unable to spread the message of god um, why would we uh, speak in other tongues if it's not being able to be understood by other people? And a follow-up, so I'll just kind of try to get as much as I can in here. Uh, another question on the Holy Ghost was, if I was filled with the Holy Ghost, been baptized in Jesus' name, live a holy, righteous life, but have yet to speak in tongues, uh, or in a while, uh, do I need to speak in tongues to be saved? Okay. So the first part, they spoke in tongues, people understood them. Why do people today speak in tongues and we don't understand them? What is, what is that? The Bible talks about the tongues of men and of angels. And, so, and then in Corinthians, it talks about an unknown tongue. Um, so people assume that speaking in tongues is only in Acts 2, but it's actually explicitly stated in Acts 10 and Acts 19. It's inferred profoundly in Acts 8. Um, It's also taught in Romans chapter 8, Romans 10, that confess with your mouth and believe in your heart is not a carnal confession. That's speaking in tongues. And then Galatians 4. So the Bible says, his spirit will come into your heart crying, Abba, Father. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean that it's not speaking in tongues. There are different administrations, and there are several examples of people that can understand it. Yeah. I have seen that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I started the church in Honduras. I'll never forget the day I heard a little girl speak in fluent English, worshiping God, and it sounded like she was from the Midwest. I love you, Jesus. Thank you, God. I magnify you you are worthy to be praised and when I went up to her afterwards I said that was so beautiful what is your name and she didn't understand a word I said wow wow 
and God had filled her with the Holy Ghost. Now, I saw that. Right. That's not something that I say to try to promote a doctrine. I saw that. Um, so speaking in tongues takes several different forms. Some of it's the tongues of men. Some of it's the tongues of angels. That day, God was using it, and they did understand it. They heard it from the countries from where they came from. Right. Um, now, if a person has spoken in tongues, but they haven't done it lately, do I have to speak in tongues to go to heaven? <clears throat> I'm not going to say that, but I am going to say that you do want to strive to be full of the Holy Ghost. And that expression, you know, the Bible does teach that he that prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself, and he speaks unto the Lord. And so there's, a, there's something powerful that happens when a person does that. So I would encourage a person to strive for that. Do you have to do it? Well, I don't really look at it that way. Yeah. Technically speaking, when you are born of the Spirit, you're born. I guess, I guess, I guess a case could be made that you don't have to. But that's kind of like, you're telling me I have to speak in tongues to go to heaven? Right. I get that one a lot. Right. Um, you know, what a great gift that God has allowed us this access to his Spirit. And I, I have the opportunity to enter into it. Thank God he gave me that opportunity. I would encourage people to, to strive to get as much of it as you can. Yeah, excellent. And, and I would think the only place that they did understand was in Acts 2. Yeah. So, you know, in reference to 10, 19, and the implication of 8, they weren't understood. That's it. You know, so uh, great, uh, great answer. And uh, we have a minute. So uh, let's end with the rapture. How about that? Woo! There's a lot on death and the rapture. <laughs> So, uh, and, and I just want to say thank you to everyone that submitted questions. It's been a joy uh, reading through them and giving me a lot of great sermon materials. Uh, and thanks to all the people that wrote sermons and sent them to me. Yeah. Amen. I appreciate that as well. So, um, probably not going to preach lots of them. But <laughs> um, do, so here's some, uh, here's maybe a couple I'll read and maybe you can answer them together as our final question. Since the Bible says we will ascend during the rapture. Does that mean our souls are still here on earth when we die? And then another question maybe tags into that here. Um, do people that are saved go to heaven when they die or when the rapture happens? Very good question. I think that when a person dies, they enter into rest. They are asleep in Christ. So... I don't think we can think of where the soul goes as, as a physical location. So my, I die, well, I die in Durham, so my soul is kind of floating around the city somewhere, <laughs> or this little ghost, Nathaniel Urshan is, you know, <laughs> this, we're, we're <laughs> yeah, I told my wife if she remarries, I'm coming back to haunt. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, I don't think we, we have very human ways of thinking of things and that spirit world, you know, we're just now entering into a world of understanding of quantum mechanics and dimensions and, and amazing things are opening up. Our, our awareness is expanding profoundly. There are dimensions to things. I don't think that we can think of hell as down here and heaven is up there and there's this cloud and an old man with a white beard and you know these are very human ideas right so where the soul is i don't think you can say that i don't think spatial dynamics apply to the spirit world i think it's a very human construct and so we are profoundly past that when we enter into that so the bible calls it abraham's bosom yeah it calls it paradise uh, it says that those that are asleep in Christ will rise first, and those of us that are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him. Um, so wherever that is, I want to be there. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> what an excellent, uh, great, great, great. Uh, well, I, like I said, there's been so much. I feel like in an hour you've done an extraordinary job, and we ought to give the Lord thanks and praise for you. Uh, Thank you so very much. And of course, I know there's so much you say, well, you didn't get to my question. Maybe in the future we can do something online and you'll be in Durham and I'll be here and we can. Uh, Let's do Biblos. Yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah, go Let's ahead and talk about that. Yeah, T tell us about it. Oh, tell you, yeah. okay. 
Yeah. Um, we need to do a Biblo session. That's what we, we'll just have you come up. Let's do it. You got to let me have him for a Sunday. <laughs> oh, they don't like that. <laughs> um, well, if you give him to me for a Sunday, we'll do a Biblo session and put it out there for everybody and we'll fix everything. We'll get it all straightened out. <laughs> um, we, we created Biblos, and it means the book or the books, and we created it to help people fall in love with the word. The Bible is so fascinating, and I think society is being dumbed down. I think yeah. we are oversaturated, we're sensationalized, we're addicted to electronics, and because of that, people are losing the capacity for literary understanding and abstract thought. And so our goal was to do our little part, to talk about things people want to talk about, celebrate the Word of God, instill in somebody a love for the Word of God and how beautiful it is, what a gift it is. And um, yeah, the, the concepts of holiness, you know, it comes from a sacrificial mindset. And so people want to reduce it to, well, you tell me I can't do this, and I can't. I mean, you're telling me I'm going to go to hell because I do that. Right. Well, that's a very reductionist mindset, and I'm not trying to look at the bare minimum I can do and skate as close as I can to hell right. Right. and still go to heaven. Right. I'm not trying to find all the stuff I can't do so I can barely make it in. Right. Right. I am actively pursuing him. Yes. I'm not trying to stay away from something. I'm going to something. And so hopefully we can, we can help people with that. I absolutely love that you say, you know, holiness is a sacrifice unto God. You know, that's our flesh being, and it's great. It's a, right. And the sacrifice stinks sometimes. It know, hurts. But it smells good to God. It does. And so uh, yeah. incredible. Any closing remarks that you would uh, feel to, to leave? And Biblos, how can we, how can we find that? <laughs> This wasn't premeditated, so yep. we're giving you free commercial time. Praise here, God. Sure. Yeah. Uh, TheBiblosNetwork.com. Okay. TheBiblosNetwork.com. You can go there. It's a YouTube page where we sit down and we, we go over scriptures. We take feedback from people, and we just, we'll take an hour, 30 minutes. I think last week I did 15 minutes because I was in a hurry. <laughs> um, I follow a very stringent schedule of whatever I feel like in the moment. <laughs> um, but... You know, in all seriousness, we're trying to address things. There's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of people who um, are very skeptical. They're, they're filled with doubt. There's a lot of church hurt, religious hurt. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people that struggle with things because they were hurt by people who may be well, you know, in a well-meaning attempt to try to force people into holiness. You can't force anybody into anything. And God gave us choice. And that's part of the beauty of holiness. So it's our attempt to try to um, articulate that and deal with it, answer some questions, have a little bit of fun along the way, and encourage people, read your Bible, and fall in love with Jesus. Amen. Well, I know Michelle's a big fan, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, so you've got a fan there. Um, <laughs> Well, I'm so thankful. And, you know, I love that we can come together in a moment like this. These are great questions. And I hope that when we leave tonight that we're challenged. And that's a good thing. You know, there's this thing in, in our culture now that says if you disagree or you challenge me that you're my enemy. And I just I want us to know corporately that that's not the case. We should always be looking to be challenged because shouldn't the mission always be to be more like Christ, to please him more. That's the pursuit. Come out from among them, be ye separate, and I will receive you. He said, and so I want to be received by God. Coming out is a celebration. Amen. They're Amen. celebrating coming out. into. Come on. We came out too. We just came out of bondage. We came out of, come on, we came out of slavery. We came out of addiction. And so whatever that is, that is a celebration unto the Lord. And so... We're, we love this apostolic message. I would like you just to pray, if we can, to, to close. Why don't we stand together and uh, as we receive the word, if you say, man, I'm challenged, I don't agree, great, go home, study. 
Find it, as, as Brother Urshan preached today. Wrestle with it, amen? Turn it upside down, inside out. Just because you didn't agree, amen, doesn't mean that, that, that you're right, amen? Go home, find it out, study the scriptures for yourself, amen? And I believe we'll be more like Christ. So, Brother Urshan, why don't you just lead us in prayer uh, as we pray over our hearts and minds. Amen. Let's pray together right now. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your great spirit. Thank you for your grace that we feel. Thank you for your overwhelming love that you have for your people. I pray that you help us tonight. Open our hearts, dear God. Open our understanding that we might learn more of you. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.